Sin Elementary School District at 7 o'clock p.m. March 11, 2015. Can we get members present? Joseph Otaidi. Marie Brizuela. Here. Manufo Miyahina Anawai. Rebecca Douglas. Here. Shaquille Ali. Here. Pledge of Allegiance by General Pershing Preschool. All right. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> As the students are preparing uh, to lead us in the pledge, um, Ms. Liayina Ano I did ask me to express her regrets to the board and the public that she's not able to be here today. She's in preparations for her mother's um, funeral services this weekend. I'm impressed by preschoolers who can pronounce indivisible so <laughs> nicely. <laughs> yeah. And we have certificates for all those students. Everyone get one? I just want to thank uh, all the children for coming tonight and the parents who brought them. We're really proud of them. And the oh, and the grandparents. And the grandparents. <laughs> and aunts and uncles. And aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers. And teachers, mm -hmm. the yeah. administrators. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you. <laughs> They're so cute. All right, before we approve the agenda, there's a request to move item 5.3, Personnel Commission Annual Report, to after the consent agenda. Okay. Then I will move that we approve the agenda so modified. Second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yep. But I think it might be worth noting that 
Um, you're welcome to take your children home, but we are doing the uh, recognizing the winners of our science, technology, engineering, and math fair coming up next, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to stay and help inspire those preschoolers, you're welcome to. <laughs> I think they've already gone, though. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Can you I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I thought well, that, that was just removing the. Uh, yeah, that was to move. Yeah, to, okay. Oh, oh same that thing. Was to, uh, that was to move it, but. Yeah, it's I, okay. I, I made the motion to approve the agenda as modified. Okay. So. Right. Second it. Yeah. Next, we have special presentations for the 2015 Jefferson Elementary School District Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Fair. Looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Do we have a Oh, wow, there it goes. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Vidalis and other members. Uh, this evening, we have a presentation of the Jefferson Elementary School District Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Fair. Um, I, with me this evening, I have David Petinari, who was our administrative intern who helped immensely with the, the whole fair. Okay, so moving right along. My name's Dana Lujan, and is this going to work? Which way do I point? Put it at the ceiling. It's actually turned on. I oh. Didn't turn it on. <laughs> okay. No, 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 not your fault. I That's guess I could have checked the most logical <laughs> thing. Okay, so this year, for the 2014-15 uh, Jefferson Elementary STEM Fair, we had students in from students from pre-kindergarten pre through eighth grade participate in the fair. We had almost, a little over 400 projects in the fair this year. So we had district-wide presentation or representation. Uh, most of the projects that did come to the district STEM fair were identified through school site STEM fairs, so the winners from the school sites were then moved on to the district fair. Our attendees included students from pre-kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, most of the projects were from students in fifth, sixth, and eighth grade. Um, the event included parents, teachers, administrators, and even board members attended the, the, the fair. Project scoring was um, included evaluation criteria such as the content and the organization of the project, the creativity, complexity, and understanding, and the overall appearance of the project. Uh, Stephen Fredericks, director of the Mathematics, Engineering, Science, and Achievement, or MESA programs from Skyline College, and his team of 21 judges came Friday evening to score all of the projects. Um, and then students who placed in first, second, or third in fifth through eighth grade were invited to uh, move on to the county fair. Mm -hmm. One of our students, Nathan Wong, uh, was re received a special award at the county fair. Oh, nice. Okay. And this is uh, all of our district finalists. We have several district finalists here this evening who would like to share very briefly if, um, and come up uh, this evening. So if you are a district finalist in, in here, uh, you are welcome to come up at this time. So if you've received an award, come on up. Keep them there while you give Would anyone like to certificates? Other projects? You would like to say a little something? Okay. Do you want to say your name? Oh, you can speak to the board. They're not scary. They're very friendly and they <laughs> love students. <laughs> but you want to use the microphone right there. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rohan Marquina, and I'm a third grader at CCB Avenue. And what was your project? My project. It's called the magic of diaper. I want to know how the diaper makes water disappear. What happened was I performed three experiments and the diaper really makes water disappear. I learned that I learned that the the diaper absorbed it and make water disappear. The easiest part was I I put one drop of food color in a glass of water. The hardest part was when I put one teaspoon of diaper powder in a cup. The finest part was when I when I stirred the food color and the water. Uh, Actually, it's not 
and magic. It's science in action. I hope it, you enjoy and and learn about my project. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. Hello, my name is Julian Ruiz and I am in fourth grade. I go to Susan B. Anthony Elementary School. My project question was how far can a rocket chemical reaction powered Lego car go? And my hypothesis was I think the rocket Lego car will go nine feet in distance. Through my studies, I learned that when an Alka Seltzer tablet and water combine a chemical reaction will happen making a large amount of gas to build until it blows causing a force thank you <laughs> hi i'm shaw nase i go to thomas edison elementary and i'm in the fourth grade in my project I wanted to find out which liquid was the most and least dense. The liquids I tested were milk, maple syrup, soda, ketchup, oil, soy sauce, and water. My hypothesis was that ketchup would be the most dense and that water would be the least dense. Through my studies, I learned that maple syrup was the most dense and oil was the least dense. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tiffany. I'm a sixth grader at Daniel Webster Elementary. For my science fair, I tested to see which fabric would make the best parachute, denim, cotton, fleece, or felt. My hypothesis was that a denim parachute would win, but the results rejected it. I learned that the felt parachute won, and my question was answered. Thank you. Hi, hello, my name is Nathan Wong, and my school is Fernando Rivera, and I'm in the sixth grade. So my project was if banana peel briquettes or charcoal would be hotter. <laughs> my hypothesis was that charcoal would be hotter because it is sold in most stores and is popular in most barbecues. The banana peel briquettes were actually hotter, but lasted shorter, while the charcoal burned with less intensity but longer. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that that was my favorite and uh, most useful science project. So I may be contacting you for the recipe for the banana briquettes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I think we have, um, and so I think we have some awards for the students. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes.
for the fifth grade. That's okay. Erin Jaden Bardia. Okay. Next one is Andres Padilla. Congratulations. Oh. Leilani Keenan. Congratulations. <laughs> this is a sad day. And Daniel John Bueno. There we go. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Sixth grade, Tiffany. Margaret McCauley Sang, Paulina Miranda, and Ashley Chavez. And More? in second place for seventh grade, we had Kayla Castro. And in first place, we had a team of two Jade Chan. And Angela Zhang. And I have for eighth grade, let's see, third place. Right, is that Levin? Maybe he's not here this evening. He's not here? Okay, we'll save that one. Uh, sec second place goes to Kayla Young. Is she here? No? Okay, we'll get that to her. And then Ange for first place, Angeline. Oh, 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 thank you all for coming this evening, and big congratulations, and thank you all for the certificates and lovely uh, calculators. Are you, Are you welcome? And I'm um, sh sure that uh, my fellow board members would like to say a few words to the students so we'll start from Mr. Uh, excuse me, Ms. <laughs> well I just want to say that it's great that you all participated you've had some success I hope you've had a chance to see how much fun it is to do science projects uh, and hope that we'll see many of you back here next year with even bigger better and more fascinating projects and and I'm interested in those banana peel briquettes too that is that is just a cool idea. It's like where that came from. Is, <laughs> so congratulations once again. So I'd like to congratulate all of the students and all the parents for coming out this evening as well. And I have been going, going to the science fair for more years than I can count on my hands. But anyway, I have to say that this year was ex absolutely exciting and wonderful. And the, some of the projects were amazing. And I did like it at the end, some of the students that wasn't able to reach the, the, the positive of what they thought was going to happen, but they knew why and how they can do it next time differently. And it's just a learning experience for all of you, and I hope that you'll keep science and all of the stuff, cr your creativity constantly in your hearts and in your minds and continue to do this throughout the years. And the eighth graders, now that you're going to go on to high school eventually here, um, <laughs> Keep up the good work over there, too, okay? But thanks for coming. I could give you accolades, but you guys got enough of that, so I'm going to give you a little bit of practical life experience. Who wants to be rich? Y'all want to be rich? No, no, let's, let's, let's be honest. Do you want to be rich? I do. Stay in science. You'll do very, very well. Stay in math. Do well in math. Do well in science, and you'll be okay. Guaranteed. So there you go. Great job. <laughs> Very happy to see that we had um, Ms. Lujan. You said there was over 400 uh, Entry. participants or entries. Um, so I'm glad to see that we have that many students who are interested in, in that. And 
shows a lot of courage and creativity to do those projects. Uh, Nathan, congratulations for getting that special award. And what was the award again? For the county. Well, we're not, uh, we don't know yet. It's, they'll, they'll, um, they'll reveal it tomorrow. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. okay. So we have more good news to look forward to. Um, so yeah, um, like my colleague said, keep going further in science and um, looking forward to seeing some of you again here next year. All right, thanks. All right. Bravo. Thank you. All right, as they filter, are there any communications? Uh, Administrator comments. I'm going to pass. Right. I just want to say that the students that are leaving, the um, it's wonderful that the, the science fair does exist and the project their projects they're doing are interesting. Give them a few minutes. Yeah. Should we just give him a minute? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were missing someone for an award, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's out of town. I'm proud then to my paper. Or one person who's always here isn't here. <laughs> Did you want to repeat your <coughs> comments, Ms. Kessler? <laughs> well, now that all the children have gone, <laughs> um, I did want to say that it's wonderful that we do have a science fair and that the projects are interesting and that they're not all doing the same thing um, because they can learn from each other and get more excited about it. And also to see that there, in some cases, was teamwork, and that's something that um, our students today are going to be probably experiencing much more than when we were young. I would like to also congratulate all the Science Fair winners. And another event that's coming up is the Spelling Bee on March 24th, I believe, the Tuesday in a couple weeks. Um, and so that's another event that we can celebrate um, student achievement and this time in kind of language arts. Um, also, we have our state assessment is, um, the window has opened, it started yesterday, and it actually is a very long window of assessments for third through eighth graders, and it's going through to the end of the school year. So some schools are starting testing now, it just depends on the grade level, but parents um, might hear about testing happening, it's on the computer. Um, and so that will be happening throughout our schools for the next three months. Board member acknowledgments and commendations. Well, since I've already congratulated the science fair kids, I thought I would call attention to something um, I saw this week that up at Marjorie Tobias, they've put in a bunch of, of beautiful planters, one for each classroom. I think they're planning to grow some vegetables. And I was really impressed. I stopped by briefly Friday morning when they were moving the dirt from the giant pile and back into those planters. I lasted about 45 minutes before I said, I have got to stop shoveling or, or I won't be able to move tomorrow. But those parents were there for hours and filled all those planters, and it looks great. So. Congratulations to them for moving their gardening project forward all right. and for being young and tough. <laughs> well, well, we, <clears throat> I just want to comment that the, the school board did have a workshop on Saturday and uh, it was a really great, a great workshop and we had our, um, the board members there talking about governance and things to be expected of the school board and it was really good. We had a wonderful facilitator, uh, Luann, from uh, the, she was a, a former president of California School Board Association and has been doing this type of work for a long time and has been with us before. And it was a really great day. So. And I, I want to put a, a kind of a good word in here for, um, they're having um, the, I'm sure, um, they're ha the Daily City Public Library Associates. They're having a um, book sale, and it'll be on um, May the 2nd and 3rd. Is that correct? 2nd and 3rd? And so they're going to have a uh, art contest. It's going to be uh, 
to all the school elementary schools around and hope and we have flyers already to our at our schools so we encourage the children to try for it there is some money <laughs> prizes they can win and and a great experience for them to do that so and um, what else do we have I think that is probably it for now and that's it all right um, amazingly nothing to say oh you know I forgot one thing I did stop over at policy to school and I watched uh, I saw what they're doing it's amazing yeah. to see the project progress they're making and what they're doing and and I got to go around the whole site <coughs> to look at everything and I feel so good to see it happening and seeing um, some of it almost ready to be closed in and um, and we're gonna be really proud of that school when it's yeah, done. they've got a great view of it from up at SBA I was, yeah. I was over there I didn't go down to policy to you can see looking it. down on it yeah and it's it's a, it's really cool to look down and see the progress that's been made yeah so just want to say it's we're really happy about that so right. mm -hmm. any correspondence um, none um, I do have comments so yeah it's great to see all of our students here today that were finalists in our district science fair um, science technology engineering and mathematics fair um, and it just caused me to think you know there's so much work that goes into putting on an event like that and I want to thank the coordinators um, Ms. Lujan and Mr. Petnari for working hard for, to communicate to all of the site coordinators who are communicating to all their site staff <laughs> everything that uh, is required and um, for the parents at home who worked with their students to help them prepare their science fair projects and the teachers who also stayed late and worked with students on their project um, it doesn't um, these these kinds of events don't just happen um, they require months and months of preparation and support um, and I'm very pleased that uh, the banana charcoal is getting some kind of a special <laughs> award at the at the at the county at the county level um, it really was uh, a very unique idea and and very well planned out and executed um, enough so that I s thought I should stop buying regular charcoal and started saving my banana peels to make my own charcoal but um, <laughs> I think there wasn't quite clear how the charcoal was made so I'm, be I'm betting it, it was an involved process maybe I won't but <laughs> I may want to try at least a couple <coughs> We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. General functions number two, the 2015-2016 AFT contract proposal, Sunshine. Uh, we were going to um, hear oh, the personnel so commission so report. The personnel right. commission, yeah. yeah. All right, so. Okay. We'll hold on to this for next time. Yeah. The next yeah. one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Personnel Commission's 2014 Annual Report. Uh, first of all, I do want to introduce our two of our personnel commissioners who are here tonight. So when I'm through with this very brief presentation, they may wish to say something. I'm not sure. Or you may have some questions. Um, Mr. Ron Appel is here and uh, Mr. Dennis Shreve. Yeah. Bravo. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go over some highlights of the report. Uh, the full report was, a, you know, you received that already. But Mr. Shreve was, is CSEA's representative on the team, and he was appointed again for another three-year term. Uh, this year, we have Ms. Sonia Reyes as the chair, and Mr. Shreve is the vice chair. Uh, one of the huge things we did accomplish this year was the classification and compensation study uh, that involved a lot of our employees. And uh, again, we really want to thank the HR staff who did a lot of work to make that happen. We had a really busy year. There were a lot of openings. It's always nice to be able to hire people. And examinations had to be given for 14 different classifications of employees. We had four promotions this year. And we're up to uh, 267 regular classified employees. So that doesn't include our substitutes, which, of which there is a huge number. And we did have four people who got to retire. Uh, one of the things the Commission does is be sure that our employees are well trained and so there's many professional development opportunities for our staff um, some a few of them that are pretty important is you know every year to do safety and injury illness prevention um, we're trying to do more with positive behavior 
for students in the classroom, you know, are classified staff also learning about how to help with that. Of course, the Common Core standards, you know, we need everyone on board and having information about that. With our large EL population, you know, to, for our aides to learn more about English language development is very important too, as is helping support our special needs population. <coughs> Um, personal commission have goals like uh, the board has goals some of them a little similar others a little different but the main thing really is to maintain an efficient HR office so that personnel operations are taken care of in a, in a really smooth way and communication another huge issue you know dealing with employees and staff and information um, out about testing and it goes on and on for communication um, Another thing really important is, you know, employee evaluation, being sure, you know, people are getting help when they may need it, and congratulations when they've been doing an amazing job. And we do try to be fair in applying our rules and the regulations of the commission. Um, we, we're also really fortunate that with the interview panels we have to have, we need people from the outside normally coming in, and we have a lot of people who volunteer their time. You know, Daily City, the city recreation department, you know, Jeff Union High School District, a lot of retirees in our district come in, and then other school districts throughout uh, San Mateo County help out also. So that's the main report. Were there any questions? No? So let's see, I saw your um, commissioners participate in professional development workshops. Um, I was wondering what type of professional development, I mean, is there an association or how does that work? Did you want to come up and address that because you <coughs> attend them? Yes, they go to um, pretty large workshops a couple times a year All right. and some smaller ones too. Mr. Appel and Mr. Sheaf could probably help out with specifics. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you for having us tonight and your report uh, is in front of you. Uh, when you ask about professional development, there are several associations throughout the state. There's a Northern California Personnel Association and there's a State Personnel Commissioners Association. I've been president of both of those groups um, representing our district as well as going to state business. So there are topics going everywhere from the Brown Act to uh, relations with employees, hiring, uh, the latest laws. So there are extensive workshops that are held throughout the year. There was just a, a, a workshop that was held just last Saturday over across the Bay for the Northern California Association. Um, so there is training and development that we do go to when we're able to and it does benefit us a lot. The one thing I can tell you from um, my experience of sitting up where you folks have been sitting and now sitting where I'm sitting here is that we have in my opinion probably the best district in the state of California. And I don't say it because I'm from here. I've seen it firsthand as I've gone around as state president to see what other commissions are doing and what's going on in other school districts. And we have a great administration. Um, the board has been most supportive. And, and I just tout everybody and I tell everybody, you know, we have by far um, the best district in the state. So, Thanks. And, any other questions anybody may have? Uh, I'm not sure if this would be for you or... Um Ms. Hopkins, but again, professional development for the classified, who provides those uh, trainings? Uh, some <laughs> trainings are done through departments, um, some through Ms. McCulloch organizing them. Uh, special education aides, there's some online training that is available to them. And um, food service has trainings of their own. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the day in October where we do a real variety of trainings on that day. It's great finding out about this professional development that's available and being administered. And also, I like seeing how many of the community members are involved to be on that um, the interview panel. So uh, <coughs> keep up the great work. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And, and one of our biggest challenges is coming up as well. It's going to be one of your biggest challenges because we have Ms. Hopkins, who's about to retire. And um, that's going to be a huge responsibility on both of our parts to hire the right fit for who's going to come in our district. And I know that's real important to me. I know it's important to you as well. So that will probably be our biggest challenge. Last year, our big challenge was to do the classification study. study yeah. 
and there hasn't been a classification, I think, since you and I sat on the board, Marie, if I'm, I'm right. That's been 20 some odd years, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, a yeah. classification study. Right. So that was huge for us to have completed that and to get done. Um, there are other districts in the state that are still arguing and fighting and, and this and that and started this classification long before we did and still haven't completed. So it's a big thing to have done and now it's, it's, it's good for the next few years and we can go. We've brought people up in salary. We've brought everything in line. So um, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, some of which you see, some of which you don't see. Um, but I can't thank the, the board and, and the administration enough for, for being there to help us for that. I want to ask a question. When you guys go to your workshops and stuff like that, and the things that you're learning, do you ever put it on your agenda to speak about it? To well, we do. Every, every time we go to one, we do speak okay. at, at, at our meetings of, of what we transpired. Our last meeting yeah. uh, we went to, there were quite a few topics that, that we came back and reported out to. Yeah. Um, that would be good something some of us that maybe go and then we'll you'll, you'll all learn more about what they're doing what they're learning yeah I mean and, and it's 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 interesting in there are tracks so there are tracks for uh, administrators for, for personnel directors there's a track for new uh, personnel commissioners mm -hmm. um, so there are different tracks that you can go and different things that you can go to um, I've had the pleasure of, of being moderator as several of the thing for new commissioners to help guide them um, so there's lots going on that we do, and, and they're going to go back. We, in, in my humble opinion, have, I think, the best district in the state. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of districts in the state. <laughs> That's true. And, well, uh, 1,000, yeah. yeah. I was, they're, they're I, I have to say, I, I was working in the district at the time that the, the, the Northern California School Board Association was established, and one of our original um, members on the personal commission Jean Kennel mm -hmm. was the one that started, you know, put it together. And so as secretary, I had to do a lot of typing for her. But anyway, um, and we we're really proud to say that she was the first president. Yes. And so now it's coming all the way and down. And I wasn't the first president. No, but that's okay. But you know, I think there were two after me. But so no, I'm sorry, but you didn't, get, recent, you didn't but get involved until later. Yeah, well, later. It just so happened that our district was up then at yeah. that time being yeah. right there on, on top of everything. So no. it makes me uh, pleased to know we're. We're still in the limelight. Yes. Well, we're, we're, we're you know we're we're low key. We don't tout you know, what we do. We just yeah. go about our business and do right. what we need to do. But as when I was state president, you know, you see all these things. You get invited to this. Mm -hmm. You get invited to that. Uh, I've been invited to the CSEA conference in Las Vegas to, to go as a speaker. Um, you know, we're just we are in a good place, yeah. and it's nice to be in that place, yeah. and it's nice to see what happens. And I can't compare us to San Francisco, and I can't compare us to Los Angeles, but to other small districts. And we are, by standards, a small district. Yeah. Um, but what the problems in a small district are the same as they are in a large district, only they're amplified more because of the number of kids and the number of staffing. But the problems are still the same. The San Francisco, I don't think, do they get involved? Because they're the city, the, well, like it's, the city it, and county, uh, and, and there's civil service. The city service. and county, is, 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 they're not involved yeah. because they're under civil service, civil service. which is merit. Um, is they, they have you know the, the Civil Service Commission in San Francisco covers them and so that's Oops. why they don't they don't come but around here it, it's us South San Francisco mm -hmm. um, San Mateo right. and, and a few others so um, nice. all right well thank you for well, thank you your years much. of service thank you yes. for letting us have the opportunity to present tonight okay. thank you, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Next, we have the 2015-2016 AFT contract proposal, Sunshine, and schedule of public okay. hearing action. Okay. A public hearing will be held on March 25th, 2015 on AFT Local 3267 contract proposal for the 2015-2016 school year. Should I keep reading? Yes. Um, it's not necessary. The hearing will be held on the 25th, and that's, that's the it. action you take is to set that hearing date today. I'll take. A, I'll make a motion that we set the date for the 25th. You said. Yeah. Yes. 25th for a public hearing. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 And number three, JESD counter proposal to AFT local 3267 sun sign and schedule of public hearing. And it's also 2015-2016. We have a motion. Move to uh, set that hearing for March 25th, 2015. Second well. the motion. 
All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 Oops. Okay. Special education update. Dr. James Adams, Director of Special Ed Ed Education, will give an update on special, special education department responses and improvements as a result of the study findings from June 2014. The board will be briefed on future plans and next steps to be taken for continued improvement in department services to students. Great, thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Mr. Vidalis. I just wanted to go over and first say thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this and also for having this study in the beginning. It really helped to organize us and get us going in the school year. Um, so what I did is here, you'll see where the checks are. That means we're finished with these items. And so basically we started um, with the recommendation of making my department part of curriculum and instruction with Ms. McCulloch. That's been very <coughs> successful. We'll be collaborating and working together. It's, it's a, been a wonderful idea and it's been very fruitful. Um, developing a structure of um, stakeholders that outline and involve us as special educators along with curriculum and instruction. Um, and develop um, teams that we have that coordinate and work together rather than being separate. That's worked out wonderfully. Um, it's an ongoing thing, but those are all been set up. The last one is developing communication plan where stakeholders and groups provide feedback. And what I did is modeled after the instructional leadership team. So I have various members of special education sit together with me um, Thursday evenings, one time a month, and I we plan together what direction we want to move. It's not, I have an idea, this is where we're going, but like at a school site, the team sit together with the principal plan, organize, let's problem solve. It creates buy-in and creates excellent ideas. So I call it the special ed ILT team, and that's been quite successful. Um, where you see these little um, cogs, that means we're still working on that area, okay? So we're still developing special education policies and procedure <coughs> manuals that can be digitally accessed across the district. So we do have a San Mateo County SELPA um, manual. So that really informs us a lot of things about legal and ethical things and things that we do follow. But we're talking about an individual plan that's specific for what we need to do in the district. So all the teams, ILT teams in each group are working together to create um, buy-in and, and a good process that we can follow and then what we'd like to do is get that so they can access that through a password because that shouldn't be public um, so that they can access to see what do I need to do when a parent does this or what is the legal action or what is the procedure if a child has needs a, a wheelchair or something like that so that's still ongoing um, the second one provide initial and ongoing professional development to staff we've been doing that I do that in the special education meetings you ask the question about our instructional assistance and aids. We actually, I have a meeting that they can come to. It is voluntary, but we do pay them on a timesheet and we provide professional developments to um, classified staff as well. But to all our school psychologists, OT, speech pathologists, there's ongoing professional development that happens. They do it within our trainings as well as at the SELPA level. They are able to go to trainings there. Um, we talk a lot about least restrictive environment, and that was one of the things that's keeping children, you know, remembering that all children are general education children first, and what we're trying to do is help those children to um, receive services in the most close to their typical age peers. That's what that whole expression means. So we're focusing on defining a service delivery model that all, prog all the programs related to special ed within the district to include this. So talking about this, planning for this in the future, um, developing special education class settings that meet needs of students and have teachers with appropriate credentials. So also we're looking at how we um, developed and talked about having SDC programs, special day programs. Um, traditionally, um, the report documented this. It was true. We used to place students based on their home region, and they'd go to school for special day classes where closest to their home, which is an excellent idea in some respect. <coughs> But the other respects, we want to make sure that class is appropriate to serve the needs of students, mm -hmm. right? So that is still a work in progress. We're working on that now. Um, the teachers have been phenomenal and, and the staff in trying to help us all understand mild, moderate, and severe needs. Who has that skill set? Where would they best be? Of course, that's a long-term solution. We can't just move children right away, but making some plans in the future for how to talk about that. Um, the last one, develop a comprehensive development um, professional development plan. We're still doing that because as we learn more information in our district, we're also learning that maybe we need some more help with behavior. 
and also helping general ed teachers. That's why this collaboration with special ed and general ed is so important, positive behavioral response. Um, there's some, some people here that still um, we're looking for, like for example, we have an inclusionist job still open. We weren't able to fill that yet. So that is an important piece that we want to have <clears throat> um, for next year, but bringing those people on board to provide us more training in those areas. Um, this one is a very good one in the sense that we're trying to help special educators understand also and access Common Core ways of helping students. The nice thing about Common Core is that there's a whole delineation that um, special educators can use in how to modify or adapt those curriculum. So making sure they're not out of the loop. For too long, special educators have not really known um, about a lot of general education curriculum. So they're being invited, they're being learned, um, being taught more information on how to learn to access that for all their students. Um, staffing and caseloads, some things that have been accomplished. We did an audit of speech caseloads over the summer um, and adjusted and, and provided more support where needed for speech um, caseloads. Another thing we did is we hired an assistive technology specialist. That person is a speech and language pathologist who's an excellent find. She came from Southern California in a district very similar to this one. Um, and she has really been helping us to save money because we were using contractors before for that. But then she's getting to know the staff and the students and just been a tremendous um, support for the program to have that person. Thank you. Um, she's also providing um, how to do low-level assistive technology. Assistive technology can be very complicated, but there's some low-level things that kids might need. Icons, board makers, little types of activities that kids can have that don't cost a lot of money. So she's really working hard. Let's try these things first before we move to some more expensive type of, of device. Um, we also have, um, we separated this program specialist and full inclusion specialist. That was something that was um, last year. Um, so we now have a program coordinator that's helped me, which is tremendous work. And really those are important because when people sit at those meetings, they really supply support to the teacher, the school site, and also back to the department to make sure we're not then cleaning up messes that end up costing us a lot of money. Um, and again, the full, um, the full inclusion specialist, we just have not been able to fill that. That's been posted for a while at that time of year, but I, I'm pretty confident we'll find someone, an excellent person in the fall. Um, the next thing is we want to talk about instructional assistance. So people um, understand that sometimes kids need supports for a short period of time. It's supposed to be for a short period of time. So we want to make sure we have a fading plan. So whenever we have an aid with a student, we want to make sure we have a plan how that student can be independent. Because the truth is in education we want kids to be independent. Right? They're not always going to have someone with them. And it could be three weeks, it could be three years. The plan has to develop and individualize for each kid. So we, we divide that. We're working through the SELPA. They also have a whole, we call a SCIA, Special Circumstance Aid Packet that people have to fill out. Um, but we continue to, um, to address that and make it important and relevant for our district as well. Can I ask a question about sure. that? Sure. So are you referring to only A's that are working one-to-one? -one? in this instance? Yeah, so, so in our world, people think of them as one-on-one, -on -one, but we tend to call them special circumstance aids. And the reason we do that is because some, we want to give flexibility in the classroom. So sometimes if we have one-on-one, -on -one, the idea is that person is right there with the kid, but sometimes you want to be able to back up and help other kids mm -hmm. to model how this kid should behave. So we call them special circumstance aids, oh. um, but that's really what it is. Someone in the classroom who has one or two identified, maybe three identified kids that they're helping, um, and that's that's really what that piece is. Yeah, good I'm question. I'm just kind of interested in how that would work to, I guess, through the IEP process to decide, mm -hmm. you know, how fast to fade them out and who's going to be faded. Excellent. We have that. That's the um, we call it the SCIA Special Circumstance Instructional Aid Packet, uh -huh. and in that packet, that's it's behaviorally based, academically based. Um, emotion, social, emotionally based, and people collect data, the school psychologist with the yes. teacher collect data to determine where a child is at, what goals the child might have, mm -hmm. and that's how they might estimate how long they need to do that for. Right. I mean, IEPs are written up to a year, right, legally, right. but you can write them shorter. You can write them for three months. You can write them for two weeks for this type of service, depending on what exactly it could be. Um, you know, I got a call today about a kid who keeps hitting a, a, another little girl in the class. He really likes her, and he's trying to communicate, so he hits her. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. right? But he has no language, so we're trying to devise a plan through the SCIA packet. Who could, how could they help this ch child over a period of time to realize how to make an appropriate connection to this young lady in class right. <laughs> versus hitting her? Right. So that's why we start doing the analysis. The school psych's gonna do the SCIA packet, and then we'll be able to determine exactly that type of estimate. But it's always an IEP team decision. Right. So the team might decide through the packet, we need someone here for three months. The team might say, you know, we'll come back at three months and see if it works or not. Mm -hmm. And the team can still say it's still not working, and they can extend it based on the goals for that child. All right, thanks. Okay, good question. Any other questions? No, okay. At the end. <laughs> sure, yeah, it's okay. Um, also, we wanna talk a lot about pre-referral process. Pre-referral is, in the law, we need to make sure kids are getting the appropriate interventions and curriculum before we identify them, right? So you can imagine if a child doesn't speak English well or is acquiring English or doesn't have any language or just moved here to this country or lots of different reasons, we, we can't evaluate them and say they have a disability, right? So the law requires us to have this pre-referral process. And what's been happening with working with um, curriculum instruction is I've been on the team with, with so many people, you can probably see their Sandys um, heading that, but really bring into our district a response to intervention plan mm -hmm. combined with positive behavioral intervention supports, MTSS, to really talk about this pre-referral process, to get and support kids before they fall through the cracks so that they're not trying to go to special ed when no one has done anything for a long period of time. And I think we've done a good job. You know, I, I, I have been in this district a long time before I became the director, and I think that We've worked hard at that, but this is a really clear way that what everyone will do it the same way. So it's been different per school site a little bit. So now this is a comprehensive way for us to be on the same page, which I think is very valuable. Does that also help to keep students out of special ed that might be put in there for behavior? Exactly. Right. That's exactly it. Um, to be honest, there is no eligibility in special ed for behavior. Exactly. There is no elig eligibility. So we want to make sure that classroom teachers have the supports they need to be able to provide um, children supports who have behavioral issues. Um, and what is being mm -hmm. done for, there might be students in there right now who are you know, placed because of behavior? Well, I would say that the, the truth is they should not be placed in there due to only behavior. So the school right. psychologist, our team, had to identify some other area a learning disability, an emotional disability, um, to be able to determine that they're eligible for special education. But they would have to have some, some co-occurring condition with their behavior to be eligible for special ed. But just having behavior on itself is not a criteria for special ed. You know, if you just don't want to do your work and say forget about it and I don't care, that's not necessarily a criteria unless the child has depression or anxiety or maybe they've been struggling, they have a reading disorder and that's how they're distracting the class. But we don't know that unless we try to help them read first. We try to help them, that's what pre-referral means. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we're working on that piece. Um, one thing that we've done is so we reviewed the process of how we do preschool assessments. We used to assess every single preschooler with the full team, psychologist, speech pathologist, teacher um, and that was just a tremendous amount of work and th the truth is it really wasn't recommended and we looked around other districts around us in the state of California across the country and really what we've done now is created a two-tier assessment where um, the team looks at each evaluation and they determine if um, the whole team should do it or if it just might be the speech pathologist and then they go ahead and do it that way so it saves a little bit of time and it helps us to be a little bit more strategic in doing that and saves our resources so we're not um, spending resources in areas we don't necessarily need. Um, the one we're still working on, pinpoint initial and triennial IEPs are not completed within a required date. Um, I only put that as still working on that because that's an ongoing process. There's very different things that come out in state reports. The truth is the state says there's no reason you should ever have a late IEP or a triennial. There's absolutely no, they don't accept any reason. So I um, run monthly reports. Rocio, the clerk that works with us now, is she just started, but she is amazing understanding our software that we do with that. Uh, she runs through that process, and we try to keep up to anticipate where this could be a problem. And we're doing very well. We have very few areas. Sometimes maybe if a family has left the country for a few months, we can't get them to an IEP or even call them <coughs> about that. So there's a few little errors there that will show up, but they're usually around that type of situation, which we can write to the statewide, but they still say, well, you're still an error. 
So anyway, um, that's really why I put that as a work in progress. It always will be. Um, we really have, again, started talking a lot about interdepartmental communication, working with HR, Sandy. I mean, that was one of the big recommendations, that special ed was just isolated. Let's bring it together in district office. So I sit at cabinet meetings. I sit with um, everyone sitting in front of you to talk and problem solve. I work at, go to the county office of ed with Anjanette and other people there. Um, to make sure that I'm really coordinating among all the players to make sure that what we're doing. So that's really what all those, and that's another reason why those cogs are still there. That's never going to be done. You never stop collaborating or working with people across departments like that. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just move to the next one. We did do a transportation study. Thank you very much. We did do that. We have some good information from that. As I talked earlier, when you're trying to look at how to define special day classes based more on a child's needs versus on where they live means that I'm also really working hard with my department to figure out some kids might be moving in different places. How does that impact our transportation now? Will it or will it not? Mm -hmm. It might be the same number of buses. It might be less. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to know. Um, from our initial analysis, it won't be more buses. Um, but it'd be probably about the same number of buses because Daly City the nice thing it's a little bit it's not so big That's so right. they can get around yeah. <laughs> pretty easily we just have to figure out how to staff those buses basically yeah. um, the other thing I wanted to share which I think was very nice and I wanted to thank FDR and AFT because this year was the first time that they sponsored a special education family night and I really appreciated that. You know, a lot of our special education families feel isolated and alone, bringing people together to talk about home strategies, specifically for kids that have some special needs, some behavioral issues, talking about um, we want parents to know what their rights are in the IEP process, that they're an equal member of that team, that they sit there with us to understand. By them knowing that, that makes us better, it has better accountability. And then we also talked about how Families can access health um, insurance, we had someone talk, for students that might have things um, like autism or other developmental disabilities. A lot of our families, we find out, are not accessing those type of resources, which now in the law, through parity, they can get. Because mm -hmm. we're always talking to families, well, in school, we have educational needs, and we provide that. But we don't have to provide in home needs that you might have. So we realize some families still have a hard time, you know, bathing their child or helping them to go to bed. Those are home needs. They need help, and there are ways to get help. So we had someone come who's an attorney that talks about um, health insurance. So we thought that was a very important thing to do, and hopefully that spreads, because that only helps the kids at home, which then helps us here at school. Mm -hmm. So that's really about what's going on. Again, I really appreciate having that. It really was a nice guideline to get the year started, um, and then working collaboratively with people. Any questions? Well, thanks for the presentation, sure. first of all. And I'm, I'm excited. I want to hear from my other colleagues first, oh, yeah. but I have a few first. questions and comments. As well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I have one question going back. Um, I don't know, it was the second or third slide, but you were, you were talking about putting up together the <laughs> online access to the policies and so forth and saying, you know, it needed to be password protected because it's not publicly available. And I was a little curious about that, mm -hmm. what kind of policies we would be having that wouldn't be publicly available. Because those would, um, I mean, I, this I, isn't, presumably isn't like talking about individual kids, it's what do we do in this instance. Exactly, exactly. I'm just not <laughs> sure if certain policies, it was recommended to me from the county that certain policies of internal, so all of the county policies are there, uh -huh. right? So yeah. everything you can see on the county website. But some things, and it could be that there's, you're right, there's nothing there confidential, but it could be burdensome to go through to be able to understand. Um, let's see, when you have a parent who's not coming to an IEP, here's a flow chart of the next steps that you need to do. I mean, the parent can totally see that. It's nothing secret or confidential. It just yeah. may not be very relevant. So first you invite them, make sure you send a second notice. By the third notice, you want to call the parent. Mm -hmm. Little things like that, right. more than, um, they're not legal policies necessarily. It's just I want to make procedures. sure pe procedures. Like let's make sure we're all doing the same thing. I don't want to hear a parent didn't come to the IEP. How many notices did you send? One, mm -hmm. right? So we want to have a procedure like this is how you're going to move through. They're not that many that way, uh -huh. but you know I'm totally open to making that public if people feel that's um, interesting to have. But it's not really. Well, I've seen mm -hmm. uh, an example of one. It was. A just one page inside of a classroom before. Yes. The flow chart, exactly how you just mm -hmm. described it. So I think it's 
um, it would be good for everyone to see. Sure. I think that's a great idea. And there's, but there's many different ones like yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Like Yours if, might be more you know, extensive. I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I think if people would like to look through it, because you can right now. I mean, if you print out the SELPA policies for a special, it's about this thick, mm -hmm. and I have it in the office. Oh yeah, but all awesome. of the psychologists can access, and speech pathologists, they can access that online. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we're trying to think something in a shorter way <laughs> mm -hmm. right. that people can have some clear procedures about what to do, how to do things. Because some of the things that some of our staff continue to say is, I didn't know what to do in that case because it's not it's not a legal issue it's kind of we just like some guidelines about what to do okay. so that's a good I'll, I'll definitely think that's something I'll bring back to cabinet and for us to um, continually to talk about that type of process just in general transparency is always good so yeah absolutely sure we're not needlessly saying oh we should yeah no yeah. there's I just didn't want to burden people but if that's right. something people should be there <laughs> it can be sep it can be separated but not inaccessible correct you know, to avoid correct. burdening people yeah that's a good point thank you that was the only question I, I have to agree I, I think it should be put out there so that everybody can see it absolutely yeah. and sometimes <laughs> the parents need to know that it's better to get it done in the beginning to have all the rest of it happening afterwards. And if you get a res one letter and you don't respond, there's there going to be another, and then perhaps yeah. a phone call, okay. and a phone call, and so, things like that. Yeah, that it yeah. means something, and then nobody wants to be, nobody wants to be called six times. <laughs> but at the same time, it, you wouldn't want them to be calling, and maybe they'll get upset at, at that call. If they know ahead of time, they know the scenario. I see what you're saying. They know what yeah. the, how the playing Makes field sense. is. But it sounds great. I'm glad to hear about everybody getting together, doing more, working together. The whole plan sounds really good, and I think we um, we needed this a long time ago. So I'm glad all it's right. here. Thank yeah. you for all your work on it and for promoting it. All right, <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Want to add anything? All right. Sorry, I'm quite done. I'm sorry. Someone yeah. applied. Oh well, uh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no problem. But um, yes, I just just want to continue that accolade. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, but also um. You know, I must default that you, that you are the expert with your kind of experience, and I want to thank you for bringing this type of energy into basically special ed because, let's be honest, it's hard, and um, we need someone like you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for saying that. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay. all right. So first of all, good move on becoming a sub department under yeah. curriculum <laughs> instruction. Yeah. I, I think that was a good move, um, and I'm I'm glad that you're working smart. And making things more efficient, but you're also I mean, you're also working hard, and and I see, you know, hopefully we'll see the results of that work. And as Ms. Brizuela mentioned, collaborating with the administration, we're glad to see that you're going in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm glad that you had the family education night as well. Mm -hmm. And then I was wondering though, has there been any progress, or what, what's the update on? I think we had teachers who were. Uh, going to get special credentials or from our district that for some of those hard to fill positions is that still happening? Let's, so Let's see, I'm trying to think. But, I know what, that um, sponsoring the Minnesota. Well, I know that we have some hard to fill positions, like speech and language ed. pathologists, so we, things like that, where we have a and relationship with San Francisco State. Right. right. Um, we're also sponsored. We found a, that assistive technology specialist, but mm -hmm. um, we're still trying to encourage and she's a district hire we're trying to encourage other speech pathologists to get that certification because there's that's the future technology we have a you know, technology director technology is the way to provide access for kids that have um, certain disabilities and right. so we really want to encourage other people to get that certification. it's not a lot but I think that might be what you mean that we want to sponsor our staff to be able to get that type of training usually it's online right. or a couple weekends um, a couple and I think it's two weekends and every third month or something for six months or something like that. It's not a tremendous amount of time, but it takes time and energy and we want to sponsor people who would like to do that. Because when you have a contractor, it's not the same as having someone who's in the schools that know the kids, mm -hmm. that know the staff. Um, exactly. So we want to continue that type of process. And you know, one of the things we're trying to do is build relationships. So we're always trying to find preschool teachers. They're very difficult to find. So trying to... Um, make relationships with San Francisco State so when people come out we're like come on over here to Daly City you know all right, all right. <laughs> you know trying to build those connections also are very important all right yeah and I've had some very nice discussions with some of the teachers and they're very pleased with what's going on oh that's so nice the, the ones that we have are happy 
And so. They like your leadership. So. Oh, that's nice to hear. I mean, I really do feel like since, again, I've been in the district for a long time, I mm -hmm. feel like we're colleagues mm -hmm. and we're building something together. I'm not trying to um, do something, mm -hmm. you know, as an authoritarian figure. Like, mm -hmm. we need to work together to problem solve. If there's something that's really not right, I'm definitely going to speak up and say we're not going to do that because that's just not right. <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, I really do see it as a collaborative effort. Well, thank you for being that way. Yeah. Nice. All right. All right. Thanks. Now? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank so, you very um, much. Mr. Dr. Adams, as you go back, I just want to thank you for your thank service you. as director. Um, you've only been sitting there for eight months, but you've accomplished a lot. And um, I think that there's still much yet to accomplish. And so, thank you for, for doing that. So. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, the board should, will, should expect another update from special ed in sometime in the next four to six months. Um, one of the recommendations of the 51 that we received <laughs> was that there were regular reports to the board on the status of the program and ways that it's <coughs> improving. So there should be another one, um, summertime, early fall. All right. It's great. It's waiting. <laughs> okay. All right. Curriculum and instruction, pupil personnel services, item number one, acceptance of donations. Once again, my, um, my favorite part of the evening. Um, <clears throat> donations to George Washington, I'd like to thank to Life Touch Environmental Volunteers, Target Take Charge of Education and Nevat Raul's Torres. Donations to Tobias is Elisha Ward and Target Take Charge of Education, Lenny Beltran. Council Member Helen Fisticaro of Colma and Mr. Ted Schlosser of Broadmoor Landscape Supply. Um, just to reiterate, at last meeting, I think California was ranked on 46 on education funding, so these are definitely um, much needed and uh, graciously accepted. Motion to accept the donations. Okay. So all of the no donations from the, the last five, six lines are, are all for Tobias, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first four were to George Washington, the last four were to Tobias. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And thank you again to our donors. Item number two, English language development reclassification updates. Benjamin Moser, English language department. Program director will present the recommendation for English learner reclassification criteria. Also, the administration recommends the Gordon Governing Board approve the use of the Riverside English Language Arts Assessment for the comparison of basic skills at the approaching, which is beginning to mid-level, proficiency level for reclassification. That's quite a mouthful, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, I'm careful with the verbiage there. So it's my pleasure to be here again this evening as I present the proposed revised reclassification <laughs> criteria for English learners. I say revise. I saw you here October 8th uh, this past fall. So since that time, we um, have used the Riverside interim assessment. So in front of you, as you know, each school district must establish a reclassification policy and a procedure based on the four criteria on the left-hand side. So what we're going to really narrow in on is the comparison of performance and basic skills. What that means is that the score we will use is from an objective assessment of basic skills in English. So for example, a student's score on the test would be in the range from the beginning of the basic level up to the midpoint of the basic level, that would suggest that a student may be, and I choose the word may, <laughs> may be sufficiently, to, uh, sufficiently prepared to participate effectively in the regular curriculum without any additional support and should be considered for reclassification. So I want to really look at what that means and show you the actual criteria. So this is a comparison of English learners to their English only and initially fluent English proficient students. So let's explore this measure for the comparison in a little bit more detail. The Riverside assessment has three performance levels, needs improvement, 
approaching and proficient. So the percentages correspond, and this is where it gets a little technical. <laughs> So the percentages correspond to the mid-level of the approaching band for grades four through six, and at the beginning level of the approaching band for grades seven and eight. And the percentage points differ for each grade level based on the performance of their English-only counterparts. So, for example, if we look at fourth grade, the average percentage score for the 232 English-only students on the Riverside for this assessment was 57%, which corresponds to the high level of approaching. But if we go back to what the state is saying, what is the actual criteria and the band, we want to look at that mid-level, which actually is 51.4%. And so what we wanted to do, it's different for each grade level depending upon how the students did at each grade. So this year, overall, we had 183, or we do have as of today, 183 reclassification candidates for these grade levels. So, when I was here in October, we were looking at the proficient level. Students hadn't taken the test. You had it in front of you. I gave you a pink copy of third grade, and I think the response was, whoa, this is quite difficult. And yes, indeed, it was quite difficult. <laughs> so we've looked at all the results. We want to make sure that students are good candidates so that they will have success once they have been reclassified. We don't want to reclassify too early, but we also don't want to hold these students back, especially when we look at, for example, eighth grade. They leave our district. We don't want to track them. We want to support them, and we want to make sure that they have the absolute most appropriate level of instruction. So with that, with your approval, what we'd like to do is use the Riverside Assessment cut points to replace what we were using before, which was the California Assessment Test for grades, um, where we had the basic skills um, 325 for grades 3 through 7, and it was 300 for 8th grade. A lot of numbers. So, short and sweet, but I'm open now to any questions or clarifications. Mr. Moser, your, your voice is very melodic, so I got lost in the numbers. <laughs> um, Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, you were saying that only, so just take the fourth graders here, I'm looking at the numbers and what you were saying, and you were saying English only, but then they were matching up to the Riverside ELA assessment, so these are English learners, or this is English only, and what's the 50% that we're talking about? 50, 50, 50, the roughly 50% was passing that third grade? So it's not passing, or proficient so in that? what we did is we looked at, we separated all the English learners. Okay. So then I looked at, again, this is comparison of basic skills, and the comparison is to their English only counterparts. Mm -hmm. So there were 232 fourth grade students, English only, and initially fluent English proficient students. Of those 232 students, the average score for all of those students was 57%. So that corresponded to the high level of approaching. So then basically we looked at the range of approaching and we basically, okay, let's take the highest off the high, the lowest from the low in that performance band. So basically we curved it. We went right for the middle. Okay. Right yeah. for the middle. So basically the highest was 57. So what was the lowest off the top of my head? I mean, 46. 46. Thank you. And then boom, 51 right in the middle. So that 46 was the lowest score of the English only or English Correct, okay. in that band. In that ba oh, okay. So we didn't want to go to needs improvement, so we set right. those aside. Approaching 
corresponds to basic skills. Uh, I'm so, that a fair number of our English only students are really like only approaching English proficiency. Well, again, <laughs> I would, when we say the word approaching, these are not, we didn't create those right. titles, so to. that's why to me, and even the percentages, because if you look at that, I, you don't automatically go to, oh, 51%, you know, you may think that, oh, those students failed. Right. But in actuality, 66% at the fourth grade level is considered proficient. Also, I'd like to add that right, even though they may be English learners, they may not be proficient in English, but they may be masters at their home language that they do at home. So in a world where we're bilingual and even trilingual, having multiple languages under our belt is, is one of the keys to success. And um, you know, we shouldn't be held, held you know, as a failure right. if we're not English proficient, like me. All right. <laughs> so I, my qu you have a question? No, I was. Right. So my question is, if a, if a student, first of all, has been classified as an English language learner. Yes. And then, let's say this is a fourth grade student, and they take this assessment, and they score that percentage, 51.4. Yes. What will you do with that student? So Are they then now considered... I mean, they're already, they scored in the approaching range, but what does that mean? Uh, what's different between that and what, what you would have done before? What I would have done before. So what I'm charged with the responsibility to look at students who may become proficient in English. So we reclassify students every year. So basically, right. we need to create a criteria to generate a list of candidates. And so this is just one of four mm -hmm. measures. So we also use the CELT test. We also have this comparison of basic skills. We also have parent input. We have a teacher evaluation. So those four criteria, all I do is generate a list. All right, so this is one way if, if they um, were to score 51.4 or above, that they might not be put into um, the classification of ELL. Correct. All right, I got it. So, and the reason that, that this is coming to the board now is because we've used for many years the California standards <laughs> test. Right. So, in this interim period where we don't have a, sta a California standards test, yeah, that's um, right. we needed to determine what's an appropriate measure for determining basic skills. Mm -hmm. And so, the process that Mr. Moser described was how we went about um, determining what is a basic what is basic skills and uh, when you saw the assessment and you s and you s we looked at the kinds of items proficiency on that would be way above basic mm -hmm. so we needed to find out you know what would be a, a good measure of basic skills we didn't want to um, because we didn't want to have a whole year lapse where we don't have any reclassification candidates because there are students there who, who, who merit um, that opportunity to be reclassified. Um, and we don't know when the state will come up with their measure. Mm -hmm. So it could be another two years uh, before that happens. So in the meantime, we're saying here's, a, here's our best estimate in evaluating the assessment as well as the results of what would constitute mid, uh, a good uh, uh, basic uh, skill in the area of English language arts. So, All right. okay. so when a student or to the terminology, if a student has been reclassified, yes, what does that exactly mean? It's it means that they would no longer be receiving additional support for English language development. Right. Now, having said that. We are also required as a school district to do what's called the RFEP follow-up, which means for two years after reclassification, we check in. We All send right. out to teachers, how are they doing? Mm. How successful have they been? Do they need additional services? So right. that will be quickly on the heels of this process. All right, that saves me another question. Oh. <laughs> so just at, just at the end of the day, since we don't have a standardized test, well, we're basically saying let's let's uh, let's put one. Let's in. take the Riverside 
um, yeah. standardize, test, and apply it and see what we can do. That's basically yeah. the question. Yes. Let's do it. Correct. For this year, <laughs> and so I will see you next yeah. year also as Something we else. determine. <laughs> well, you. Yeah. It may be a couple of years until we determine another, another measure. Are there any other districts close to here that are using that? <coughs> Riverside or not the Riverside so you know in the county everybody has interpreted this in a different way we wanted to have something also that was objective, objective and certainly ease well it has not been an easy process quite honestly <laughs> to uh, gather this data but something that was objective uh, that we could generate um, a candidate list all right okay Thanks for that report. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Putting the safety net in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then I believe we could make a uh, motion to approve the use of the Riverside English Language Arts Assessment for the comparison of basic, sk basic skills for reclassification. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Well done. Business. All right. Business and financial procedures, item two, second interim budget review. Hi. Hi. Okay, here we are, back again. <laughs> <laughs> Guys are getting used to it. meeting like this. <laughs> so we're doing the second interim report tonight, and school boards are required to certify the current year and the following two years fiscal position of the district. Um, that we are in a good financial position. Um, these are the interim reports. We did the first interim report already. That was a snapshot of the district's financial position in, at the end of October, but it came to you in December. And this one, uh, the second interim, is at the end of January and it's coming to you now. We've put it together. Um, the interim report includes a multi-year projection, which of course is very important since you're certifying the current and the following two years. Um, the 15, 16, and 16, 17 years are um, a part of the official in interim report, whereas the 17, 18 year is uh, additional. So we go out one extra year so that you can see where we'd be if all of our projections were correct, correct and complete. Um, so since the first interim report, these are the changes that we had, um, it's just a graph of the changes that we had um, for revenues. As you can see, the only thing that really changed significantly at all, and it's really not all that much, is the revenue limit as well as the contributions. So on the next page, I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the revenue limit changed because um, when we adopted the budget, and until recently, um, the state had decided to fund 29.56% of the uh, targeted gap in the LCFF. Well, they reduced that and they <coughs> went down to 29.15%. Um, so that did affect the amount of funds that we are getting this year. That means that in the following years, there's more to receive. Also, we have a slightly lower unduplicated count. Um, last year, we had 73.71%. And this year we have 73.33%. So that simply means that we have slightly fewer free and reduced EL or foster students um, unduplicated. So those two years are taken together. It's supposed to be a three year average, but we only have two years to go on. This is only our second year. So those years are taken together and we have a two year average of 73.56% on duplicated count and that's what we're being funded on. So that's why we have the 111 thousand dollar reduction in um, revenue limit. Local um, revenues have um, increased a little bit and mostly because of the solar rebate um, and then a, a slight reduction in the coma um, revenues that we're receiving from outside renters. And then the contributions to restricted programs, that has increased by three hundred forty eight thousand dollars and that's because um, we are building the common core um, and we're doing a transition and the expenditures for the transition are expected to be greater than um, the revenues that we received. As you know, we received $1.2 million and we do have to spend those funds by the end of this year and we felt that there's a little bit more we need to do and that's in um, technology, providing technology for the students 
uh, for the teachers and also a lot of staff development that's been going on. So then we get to the expenditures. And you see the expenditures look like they've um, grown a, a huge amount if you look on the right hand side, but we'll get to that, so don't worry about it. Um, and really the only significant ones are the um, books uh, and supplies as well as um, services and then other outgo. So in the books and supplies, um, we have uh, furniture that we are going through the district and we're replacing furniture. Um, several schools at a time from year to year. And so TRP and Woodrow Wilson um, have received new furniture. Wilson. And then... Hmm? Will. Huh? Will. We're buying it now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Will receive it. Sorry. <laughs> have received Will. Just They're in the budget. How's that? It's in the budget. The TRP and Woodrow Wilson have received the budgets for, <laughs> <laughs> for the purchases of the new um, desks and such. Um, also, as you recall, we um, a couple months ago, um, you approved us to move forward in replacing um, very, very old maintenance vehicles. So we've got three of them that we're going to replace, be replaced and replacing. And um, so that's in here. Upgrading the uh, wireless, no, the district-wide radios, um, which we need. Apparently, the towers aren't really working well, and so we need it for emergency services. And then um, the other items are, are quite small in comparison. Um, and we get down to the services. Um, there's a lot of realignment. And as you'll notice, there's realignment both in the, um, the books and supplies as well as the services. It's because the, the school sites are kind of moving their budgets around a little bit where they uh, decide they need to spend more here and less there. So um, that movement causes uh, the budgets to change in, in the major uh, areas, um, but mostly there's there's additional after school, after school program um, expenditures, and also um, there was an upgrade in the repairs and upgrades in the floors and of the library and the um, office at uh, SBA, um, and then of course the big one is the 3.9 million dollar um, increase in the other outgo, and that's because expenditures. That's because we move those funds to Fund 17 to support the future textbook adoptions. Um, and so that was um, an item that you um, all approved a couple of months ago. Um, and so we moved 3.9 million over, which gave us a balance of approximately 6 million. And then we committed those funds to textbooks. So that's what that is. It's really the movement of funds from one fund to another. So how did that change our um, fund balance for the end of the year? Well, at first interim, we expected to have $11 million at the end of the year, but we increased our, um, we decreased our revenues by $440,000, and we increased our expenditures by $4.4 million, and as I said, again, mostly because we just transfer those funds over, and they are sitting there, and they can be uncommitted at any time that the board decides that that should be done. Um, and so our end fund balance is down to $6 million. And then we have uh, a 5% um, reserve for economic uncertainty. And so we have $2.7 million that is um, unallocated at this time. And that's also used for cash flow. So um, we get to the multi-year projection. Um, need to let you know what it's based on. What kind of assumptions do we have? So um, the current year, the 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, we have these COLAs, and we have the LCFF target um, being funded at the gap in the target being funded at these um, different levels. And this is a more conservative one, and I will show you later the um, more liberal one that the, the state is um, saying that they're going to do, but um, this is what school services is recommending. Um, additionally, the other state revenues are flat, so overall there's a basic conservativeness as we normally do to the budget because I would much rather come back and tell you things are better than worse. Um, and then for the 15-16 year, uh, the state is planning on giving us additional one-time 
Common Core Mandated Cost Reimbursement Funds. So they're kind of calling the same dollar a couple different things. I'm paying you back for this and I'm giving you this, but it's the same dollar. So we will be, get, we will be getting a, a one-time million dollars in the um, fiscal year 15-16. So when you look at the multi-year projection, you will keep in mind that the following the out years, those funds disappear. So it will um, look like revenues aren't going up as much as they should. And that's because um, it's a, it's a one-time revenue. Um, also for the federal revenues, Title I um, is receiving approximately a 12% cut from the feds. And so it's going down from uh, 693,000 to 610,000. And um, we're projecting that on all, all projected years um, until we get something that says it's going up or down, we maintain it where it is. So um, ADA, we actually, as I said before, um, decreasing slightly in um, enrollment. And so when enrollment goes down, attendance goes down, obviously. Um, the percentage of attendance shouldn't go down, but the ADA that we get goes down. So <clears throat> at first interim, we noticed that the ADA um, or enrollment had dropped approximately 59 students. And um, at this time, we've regained a lot of them. And so compared to this time last year, we've only dropped down 27 students. So we did regain more than half of the students that we had originally lost. And um, when we do the budget, we have what's called declining enrollment, enrollment protection. So we get revenues from the state based on our ADA. And um, if, our aid, if, if we have 6,000 students that um, we have in ADA last year, and this year we only have 5,900, for one year the state will fund us on the 6,000. And then next year, if we were to drop again down to 5,800, they would fund us on this year's 5,900. So it's called declining enrollment protection. And so we build that in, mm -hmm. that's built into the um, the multi-year projection, and so eventually we catch up with it, or or enrollment goes back up and ADA goes back up. Um, and so then also here's our unduplicated account again, which you saw a little earlier, but um, here's that 73.52 percent, the two-year average of these amounts, and then um, the following year um, we've made it as though we have the first year and the following two years at 73.3%, mm -hmm. which would then cause it to drop a little bit more. And then the last two years out, the average, if this happened three years in a row, that would be the average. So, um, and then step and column is also included in the multi-year projection. So let's look to see what that looks like. Um, as you can see this year, don't worry about this again, this was moving $8 million out to cover um, post-employment benefits as well as $3.9 million into Fund 17 for that textbook adoption. So that's what that is. Um, the following years, you see we've got a $2.5 million um, increase, and then we drop down a little bit. And that's um, a lot of different things, but mostly it's because of the, um, the one-time common co million dollars, common core monies that we um, We'll be getting only for one year. Um, is that money? Um, is that already? What is the million dollars going towards? The technology and the professional development for well, Common Core transition. Um, I think it'll really be a part of. We are not actually required to spend it. They're calling it Common Core, mm -hmm. and they're calling it repayment of um, mandated cost reimbursements. Right but they're freeing it up for any use. Oh, that's good. So they're also calling it um, unrestricted. Great. So they're calling it lots of different things, but, in, <laughs> but basically they're just giving us a million dollars. And so it will be the LCAP that determines um, how we spend it. Great. Too bad they're not giving us a million dollars for each name they apply to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. Okay, so this is what our fund balance looks like. Um, using those assumptions. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is still conservative. This is conservative, but 
we have one. The next slide might help you a little bit. I want you to know what's not included in here, right? Oh, okay. So there's two really important things that aren't included in here, and that is um, there's no step, there's no salary and benefits increase for staff. There is step and column, but there's no salary and benefits increase, and that's because we're in the process of negotiations. Um, so when you look at that, it could change, most likely will. Um, so going back. Um, additionally, program expansion. What are we going to do with the LCAP? Right. You know, what will um, what will the uh, the groups that um, Sandy is working with and um, yeah, what will they recommend? What will the district recommend? What will the board approve um, in moving forward with additional programs? Um, again, here is um, what we base the budget on the um, the targeted gap and what the state was plans on funding for the following years. This is what the state plans on funding and this is what we have in the budget. So the 15-16 year is the same. There's no difference because that's what the, the governor said these, they're going to do. And um, the other two years you see is almost 24 percent and 26 and a half percent and we have like half, less than half that, about half. That. So basically, we we take whatever they say and cut it in half, making well, the expectation. Well, school services that doing is doing that in this case, you know, and I don't know how they come up with that, but we use the more conservative one. I want to thank you, but I'm going to cut your promise right. in half. <laughs> so, and then of course, what we've got to keep in mind in that multi-year projection is exactly what I was talking about: the new program, the program expansion, and such. Is um, the adopted L cap is what's going to drive the future expenditures of the district. All right. That's good. Okay, so this is what we would look like if we use the state funding. Um, what they're saying they're going to do it. See up here, you can see that's saying what it's going to do, and the other one had hours. And you see how that changes the um, these two out years, the current year and next year are the same because we have the same. Um, we're using the same numbers, and then instead of being about seven hundred thousand. Um, each of these years, we have almost two million and three point two million. So um, that is a less conservative one, Let's see. of course. Or to look at it in another way, if they actually come through, we have more resources to do what we need to do. Right. Correct. <laughs> so we're not exactly. Mistake. But we're not committing them until they actually come through. Right. And and in actuality, as you remember, last year when we adopted the budget, we decided we wanted to front load mm -hmm. um, a lot of our um, our SNC grant type expenditures um, and use some reserves strategically use some reserves to fund those until these funds caught up with us and they're catching up with us oh, I mean 29.15 percent for the current year 32.19 percent for next year that's a lot of money that we're we're getting because mm -hmm. we are winners because we have such a high um, unduplicated okay. count. Right. So this is what our fund balance looks like um, with the state, with the state funding levels that they say, but again, without negotiations, without program expansion. So obviously we're going to be able to do that mm -hmm. to a degree. So cash flow, <laughs> this is this is the first year the deferrals are gone, both inner year and, and intra year. So they're not hopping from year to year. We are going to get our money in the current year, which is, I, I'm not sure how many years it's been, but there was a time where about a third of our money was coming in the following year, and now we're going to get it all this year. Um, and, and not only that, but we're going to get it based on the apportionment schedule that we're supposed to be getting. 559 means 5% 5 in July, 5% in August, and 9% in the other 10 months, so we get our 100%. Mm -hmm. That's the way, that's what Ed Code says. That's where we're supposed to get it. Um, and, oop. oh, good Lord. Sorry. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> but it seems thing. like the <laughs> top part is a little bit gone there, isn't it? Oops. There. So, make sure I press this button. Um, also, we're getting some property taxes now, a little bit, um, for the current year and the subsequent two years. 
And in the year 1718, the negative ERAF, or should I say, the negative ERAF will still be there, but we won't have to, we won't have to pay it back. So um, we, by the negative ERAF going away. What's a ERAF? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's a tax, there's this triple flip thing. It's, it's very, very confusing. Um, the, the state was getting some of its funds by charging San Mateo County the money, so San Mateo County would pay the state these funds, and therefore the state, it came out of property taxes, and therefore the state had to turn around and pay school districts more um, uh, state aid because, so it was kind of going back and forth. So it was really, instead of us getting property taxes mm -hmm. directly, we didn't get it, the state got it, and the state gave us money instead. Okay, so the state. So, 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 it's, it's so the net state zero. skimmed the they, top. <laughs> well, no, we get exactly the amount that we're supposed to get. We do get it all, but according to the state schedule uh -huh. instead of the property tax schedule. Okay, cool. So, um, but that is ending in 1718, and so um, we will get a lot more money in property taxes, and um, but not additional money. We'll get more in property taxes, less in state aid. Right. Mm -hmm. So the dollar amount won't have changed, but this has to do with cash flow, mm -hmm. and it will affect cash flow. Um, and not, not negatively, it'll just yeah, be different. Um, also, we still get the, um, the Education Protection Account funds, and that's for the Prop 30 additional tax revenues. Um, and about 21% of the state aid that we'd be getting would be coming through this account. Um, and then also remember, always remember, that if we drop below in, in cash, if we go negative, we borrow, we automatically borrow from the funds that are in the other funds. Mm -hmm. The county allows us to do that, so we're able to... Uh, With interest? No interest? Well, we get interest. Okay. We get interest on the monies that are in the other funds. If we go negative, we'll have to pay a little bit of interest here, but we're making interest in the other funds. So um, that's basically it, and the recommendation to the board is to approve the second interim as a positive certification because we are able to meet the current year and subsequent two years um, financial uh, obligations of the district. Any That's questions? definitely great news that we have positive certification, and I saw a hand up, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, with our cash flow up, and it seems like we're getting all our money this year, um, I know we usually have to f float bills out there. How much in reserves do we need to float our bills? Um, basically, how much do we need on our so check into book account? To to make sure that the bills are paid well, whether we get our money in or not? We've always been able to do that because of our high reserves. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which um, is about, or basically just say operating, operating cash that we need in the bank. We don't have to float this well, year. It, it fluctuates from month to month, but for the most part, um, the getting the funds in the other fiscal year meant that we were we were using reserves to pay for our obligations rather than using the current year funds. Mm -hmm. um, and so because we had high reserves, we were able to do that. We are still, we would still be able to do that, but it, no, it becomes to. less necessary to borrow it because we're getting it in a more mm -hmm. um, even basis. So we're, we're not waiting until the next year to get it. And so we're less likely to be able to, to need to borrow from our other funds. And the reason I want to bring that up because it's, <laughs> it's often, it's often um, stated that we have all these reserves, we have all these reserves, but in actuality, we also use it for operating cash, um, cash, cash flow. flow. Exactly, mm -hmm. so we need those the reserves basically to keep us going or That's then true. we reach insolvency. Um, the true. second question that I do have um, is on slide four, LCF gap funding is decreasing from the state 29.56 down to 29.15, which is, um, uh, de minimis, let's say, compared to what the feds are cutting down, they're reducing yeah. Title I by 11.95. Now, the reason I ask this is understanding that this is another dot-com bubble. We're, at the, we're reaching the peak of it, probably, as, as the economist, at peaking next year or the year after that. This is, this will, this is a bubble. Um, and they're already reducing Title I by 11.95%. Is there something that we have to start doing now 
to make sure that we have the reserves when this bubble pops? Um, ba basically, I'm, I'm, I'm gloom and doom that things are going to get worse. Well, okay. And the, um, and the reason being is that these people already see it by cutting, by cutting Title I by 1.95%. Well, um, I think the, the Fed's cut is based more on the level of poverty in our district versus um, funds available because other districts in the county are seeing increases in their Title I funds where poverty has increased um, in their, within their district boundaries. So this is uh, because we have fewer poor kids estimated in our district boundaries than we did in 2000 and 2010. So, right. so Title I is not specific to the nation, but specific to each district? It both. Yeah. Both. But remember, our unduplicated count went down, which means it's mostly based on our free and reduced. Mm -hmm. If our free and reduced go down, our federal programs are often based on our poverty level, as Mr. Vidalis had said. So in other words, the, the federal government hasn't actually cut the allocation to Title I, but they rebalance it every year to match the students as they are in all the different districts. So, mm -hmm. so that's maybe and, not. And I think I mean, the census might helpful. have something to do with it as well. Um, possibly, yeah. Census driven. So, I mean, did we lose Which 11? isn't on a yearly basis. It's so I think the way that the, so the, the federal government funds Title I at the state level. And then the state distributes it to the counties and, like, and then to the districts. Um, so, like I mentioned, there are other districts in our county that are, are seeing an increase in their Title I funds because they've, whatever measure they use to estimate um, students in poverty or families in poverty um, has shifted since the last time they measured it. So we should use those metrics. <laughs> um, and I, I, I guess just what I'm saying is that um, a, a reduction in, in poverty level, plus we're one of the um, least economic districts in, in the county. Um, it's just really interesting that other counties are going up, ours is going down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and where I would be more concerned thing, is as the Prop 30 um, temporary taxes mm -hmm. sunset in the end of 2016 for um, sales tax and the end of 2018 for the highest income earners, the, their personal income tax. Those are the areas that I would be more concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, the state does believe that the economy will improve enough to compensate for um, those lost revenues. We'll see what happens. But we are at least um, projecting revenues on a more conservative basis but still being reasonable. Yes. Is there any, any other question? Yeah, no questions. No. Uh, very positive report. Yeah. All right. So I think we need. Bravo. So we I have would, a motion. Yeah. I will make the motion to approve the filing of the certification of financial condition and to approve the revision to the working budget to correspond with the projected year totals. Second the motion. Those in favor? Aye. 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 We already did the personal commission. Yeah. Board policies, administrative regulations. The board will revise and, excuse me, the board will review and revise board policies, administrative regulations from April 2014 CSBA board policy revisions as stated in a first reading. Well, <clears throat> thank you for carrying it over for this time. Uh, I read a lot of the, I read the whole thing, not a lot of it, the whole thing. I do have some um, questions that, that I wanted to follow up on, but there's nothing I want to take up time here. Right. It's sort of just a more of a better explanation to, uh, of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So I'm going to be meeting with Bernie on this. So unless there's any other changes from anybody else. I had no change. Motion to approve the first reading of the report. Okay. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Board member comments and reports down this way. Uh, no further comments. I think I've nope. commented enough. All right. Ms. Brizuela? Um, I did attend a city council meeting at, and um, oh, we did, I did mention to them that uh, of the new uh, city 
and the school district committee and that we look forward to working with them and sort of looked like we had a good response to that. All so right. <laughs> we're hoping that we'll be able to meet with them and, and uh, continue our partnership with them because we do have a contract already with them on partnership and yes. we need to keep working on it and perhaps fulfill some of the things that uh, Mr. Waters was trying to get done. Yes. And uh, I think it will be the benefit for all of our students. Mr. Otaibi. I would like to thank everyone that stayed in this packed house tonight. Um, <laughs> and it was difficult to move around, but thank you very much. And um, <laughs> great job. Well, we did. It was packed house in the beginning. It was. With all the children. Uh, as, as was mentioned before by Ms. Brizuela, we had a board um, self-evaluation special board meeting on Saturday. And I just want to report that what stu stood out to me was that all the board members who were present we were on the same page as far as our unity of purpose and really our feeling that the students, the families, and the communities really love our district. There was an emotional attachment. <laughs> so that really stood out to me and I'm glad that all of us are up here um, from a place of service and really wanted to see the best for our students and for our community. And I want to commend my fellow board members for that feeling that I had on Saturday. Any persons wishing to? Well, let me, let me add to that. Right. Uh, while it was a wonderful thing, we also had Bernie as part of our governance team. And it was great how we all fell in that same loop, including That's true. Bernie as well as the board members. So it was a great, uh, great day. All four of us and Bernie. Yes. <laughs> And there's no speaker card, so we will convene to close session at 8.50, what is that, 4? Close. We get ourselves a little.